invite you to open your Bibles this morning to Genesis chapter 29. You can find that in the Pew Bible on page 29, I believe. If you don't have a Bible, you can take that Pew Bible, consider it our gift to you. We've been walking through chapter by chapter, the beginning of the Bible in the book of Genesis, to see God's redemptive plan revealed to the world. And we continue on that redemptive journey this morning in chapter 29 by looking at Laban's interaction with Jacob and what that means for the heritage of God's people. Genesis 29, starting in verse 1. Then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. As he looked, he saw a well in the field, and behold, three flocks of sheep lying beside it. For out of that well the flocks were watered. The stone on the well's mouth was large, and when all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep, and put the stone back in its place over the mouth of the well. Jacob said to them, My brothers, where do you come from? They said, We are from Haran. He said to them, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? They said, We know him. He said to them, It is well with him? They said, It is well. And see, Rachel, his daughter, is coming with the sheep. He said, Behold, it is still high day. It is not time for the livestock to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go pasture them. But they said, We cannot until all the flocks are gathered together and the stone is rolled from the mouth of the well. Then we will water the sheep. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. Now as soon as Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob came near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept aloud, and Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's kinsman, and that he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father. As soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. Jacob told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, Surely you are bone of my flesh. And he stayed with him alone. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Jacob loved Rachel, and he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter Rachel. Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave his female servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her servant. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, It is not so done. Laban said, It is not so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his female servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be your servant. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah, and served Laban for another seven years. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, Because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. She conceived again and bore a son, and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. Again she conceived him with a son, and said, Now this time my husband will be attached to me, because I have borne him three sons. 
Therefore, his name was called Levi. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, This time I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah. Then she ceased bearing. Let's pray together. <coughs> Holy Spirit, do in us what you will with this word. Help us to recognize that even though our lives are full of sin and deception, they're full of broken relationships, you are at work behind the scenes and in and through all the details to produce glory. If we would but be content with your gospel, if we would trust in Jesus, if we would know the blessings of the covenant only come through him in order to change our lives so that we praise you, even in the midst of trial and suffering, we praise you. In the midst of brokenness, we praise you. Help us to be those kinds of people and to receive this word as good news so that we might be changed more into the likeness of Christ, we pray for his sake. Amen. Usually, no one likes being tricked, unless you've got the option of receiving a treat also. Then that might be all right. During the, the late Renaissance period, one of the popular events that people started going to was a masquerade ball. I don't know if you've been to a masquerade ball. I haven't. I've only seen them in, in movies and things like that, where you, you wear a mask to hide your true identity. And part of going to the ball, part of the fun of it all, is the suspense of not knowing. Right? I mean, part of your identity is kind of concealed, and so there's this, this mystery that people like. It's the same thing that attracts people to mystery novels, you know? And you keep reading through because there's this mystery hidden there, and you want to figure out what's going on in the story so that at the end, you know, you're kept engaged all the way up to the point of where, voila, you know? I mean, everything's solved. The mystery is, is presented. Well, in this passage this morning, there is a masquerading. There is a deceiving. There's a tricking going on here. And it's with Laban. If there's any character in the Bible you don't want to be like, you don't want to be like Laban. Laban was a deceiver. And in this passage, we see Laban, who's Rebekah's brother. Just remember Rebekah as we walk through Genesis. You know that this is uh, the wife of Isaac. It's her brother. And he is doing something that is so deceptive that it's actually hindering what God has promised he was going to do through Jacob. And Laban, when he does this, doesn't even recognize the forces that he's messing with when he's messing with Jacob's inheritance. Because Jacob's inheritance is all the promises of the covenant that God has promised to bless the world with. And so he's messing with the heritage here. At this point in time, in the story of Genesis, Rebecca's been gone a long time. She's been gone for nearly a century. And so it's no wonder that whenever Jacob comes, he's received with glad tidings because they are probably looking for some news about Rebecca and what has happened to her. And as we've seen through previous stories, what happens when Jacob comes is we see drama. There's always drama with the family of God. Same is true for in church today, isn't it? But there, there's always drama going on. And we see this drama unfolding right here before us. And yet, it's through the masquerade, isn't it? It's through the tricking going on, the mystery of what's happening here and all the, the, the dynamic of all these relationships. We see God producing something good. God is still working for the benefit of those he loves, just like he is today, in the midst of drama, working for our good and all the details. And so in the passage, it's really broken into two parts. What's happening? The first part is seeing Laban's deception. Laban's unfaithfulness. The second part is seeing God's faithfulness, God's clarity, God's blessing. And how both of these are contrasted against each other so that we don't put our hope in ourselves, so that we don't put our hope in what we try to do to manipulate situations and get our way, like Laban was doing. But we put our hope in God and in what God is doing with his covenantal blessings in our lives, even in the midst of trial, even in the midst of of drama. So as we walk through this passage this morning, I want us to see those two things and how those two things don't mix. They're not going to mix together so that we're gravitating towards God's faithfulness. Not the faithfulness of man, not our faithfulness, but God's faithfulness to us in the covenant. So we're going to look at Laban's deception and we're going to look at God's love. We're going to look at man's unfaithfulness and we're going to look at God's faithfulness. It's the difference between kale and candy, right? There's a huge difference between those two. 
That's what we're going to look at, all right? So let's start with Laban's deception, Laban's unfaithfulness. Let's look at verse 1 together. Then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. As he looked, he saw a well in the field, and behold, three flocks of sheep lying beside it far out. For out of that well, the flocks were watered. The stone on the well's mouth was large. So what's going on here? Well, obviously they used the well to water the sheep, right? And there would be these large stones. And what shepherds would do is the shepherds would move these stones because in moving the stones, they would be sort of like a contract. This is something that was sort of unspoken that was done in order to help them actually water their flocks. So Jacob comes to one of these wells where they were doing this, and he's in search for Laban. He's got to find Laban because if you remember, he's on the road to Adam Aram. And Jacob begins talking to these shepherds at the well, and all of a sudden, who should approach Laban's daughter, Rachel? She's approaching, right? We see her approaching, and look what happens in verse 9. While he was still speaking to them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. Now as soon as Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob came near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. So now he's going to make this contract, according to the well and the water, with Rachel. And then it says in verse 11, then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept aloud. Now, I don't know what you did on your first date, but uh, I bet it wasn't watered sheep, and they kissed each other. That's what he does. And he has this first encounter, and because Rebecca's been gone, she knows that this is a kinsman of someone, a part of her family. So she's excited to see him, and she goes and she tells uh, her father Laban that his nephew has arrived, and he's come. And so what does Laban do? Verse 13, he greets him. Verse 13, as soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. Jacob told Laban all these things. Don't you wish you had that initial interaction with your father-in-law, right? You wanted to ask for your wife's hand in marriage. Don't you wish he just picked you up and kissed you? You probably didn't do that, you know? The first thing my father-in-law said was, he said, I have some questions for you. <laughs> okay. What are they, Mr. Bruce? You know? Sat me down, asked me some questions. But it looks like at first, Laban is very welcoming to Jacob. And it says, Laban said to him in verse 14, Surely you are bone of my flesh, and he stayed with him a month. So Laban is not totally caught off guard with Jacob's heritage or his family. He understands the blessing that's been handed down from Abraham to Isaac, and now to him on some level, he is understanding that he is the possessor of the covenant and what God is doing. And so he begins talking with him, and they begin to sort of bargain, if you will, don't they, for Rachel's hand in marriage. And so what he does, long story short, we just read it, he ends up working seven years to pay Laban for the opportunity to marry Rachel, which was customary. I mean, that, that was normal for that to happen. Laban says, okay, but then what Laban does is Laban deceives Jacob. And this happens in verse 22. So Laban gathered all the people in the place and made a feast. This is the wedding feast that he's supposed to have for Rachel. But in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. So here's the deception right here going on. It's not difficult to see that Laban is making a huge mistake right here. He doesn't realize that God, in his providence to Jacob, promises that he's going to bless those that Jacob blesses, and then he's going to curse those that Jacob curses. That's the forces he's messing with here. And so whenever he does this, what he's doing is he is sort of determining how the offspring who receive the blessings are going to come. They're going to come through Leah, not through Rachel like Jacob wanted. Because if you remember what God had told Jacob to do, he told him to, that he had to go and find not two wives, but one wife. One wife. And so it's the deception, it's the sin that's starting to create all of this steaming chaos here in this family that's going to ultimately result in dysfunction. And it's going to be affecting the destiny of God's blessing of the covenant. Now, if you remember this blessing that's happened to Abraham, this is not the first time it's taken an unexpected turn, has it? Remember Abraham, whenever he was supposed to... Uh, have children, he ended up taking Hagar, didn't he? Which was a mistake. 
But when he took Hagar, and when he slept with Hagar, God ended up blessing Hagar. So God's not caught off guard by what's going on here because this is something that's been normal in the family thus far. And what Jacob ends up doing here is he ends up serving another seven years for Rachel so that at the end of the day, he ends up having two wives, not just one, which would be consistent with his predecessors. But it still doesn't mean it's faithful to what God had said, does it? And so that's where we can begin to see that even though there's deception among God's people and there's sin happening that creates this drama, God is still faithful. It's the unfaithfulness of mankind that creates drama in the world. So maybe you've watched the show Family Feud. Family Feud, it's not just a game show, is it, though? Family Feud can be something that's real in our lives. When the human heart is bent on getting its own way, which happens in all of our lives in some way, shape, or form, on a regular basis, when we're bent on getting our own way rather than loving God and loving others, what is going to happen is chaos. That's what's going to happen. You're going to have a breakdown in relationships. You're going to have a breakdown in your family. You're going to feel sinned against. You're going to be sinning against someone else. And it is going to be hard to piece back together the brokenness that's going on in the midst of that chaos. People with messed up lives. Jacob was a messed up life. Have you ever been work at work and you needed to use the copy machine? Maybe you've been a teacher. I was thinking about teachers this week. And whenever you're at work, you've got to use the copy machine. Have you ever been using the copy machine and all of a sudden there's a policy that comes down from on high about how many sheets of paper you can use at that copy machine? Does that ever happen? Maybe perhaps that happened because someone lied about the number of sheets they used. Am I right, Shelly? I mean, is this a, we're, we're drifting towards the truth here. What ends up happening with that one little lie that one person has said about how many copies they have made on the copy machine is it affects everyone without them even realizing it. Because all of a sudden now you've got policies outside of your control, these forces that come, and they start affecting you personally and how many copies you can make. The same is true with students at school. Kids, have you ever borrowed a pencil from your neighbor? You ever borrowed a pencil from someone? Abram, you probably didn't. Oh, you did? Were you working on something? One time? One time you needed a pencil and you borrowed it, right? Have you ever had the teacher say, no more pencil borrowing? This is not going to happen. Why did the teacher say that? Because someone lied about it. That's the reason. About the pencils they were borrowing, they were borrowing and all of a sudden now it affects everyone. That's what sin does. In the Bible, in the local church, the church at Corinth, one little sin was described as leaven, yeast, and it starts infecting the whole lump of dough, because that's how infectious sin can be in the lives of God's people. And the same is true in the church. You may think that your apathy, for example, towards the gospel, or your apathy towards participating in the local church ministry doesn't affect other people. It affects other people in the local church. If you're struggling with some sort of habitual sin in your life and you're so scared to confess because if people found out, you'd be so embarrassed and you wouldn't know how to get help, even if you could get it. You harboring that habitual sin, it's affecting the relationships around you. It causes a breakdown in how you actually interact with others. That's what sin does. And what Jesus does in our lives with the gospel is he comes and exposes those kinds of sins so that we can repent. Repentance is not just feeling sorry for a sin. All of us can feel sorry that we've sinned. Repentance is really letting the light of the gospel expose us for who we really are and then changing where we were once hard-hearted and bitter towards this person in the church for whatever reason. Just think about how long people can hold a grudge in a church. People hold grudges in the church for 20 years, 30 years, their whole lives about one little thing. Rather than letting the gospel expose that and being vulnerable and then changing from not harboring a grudge, not being bitter, but being loving, being generous, being gracious. That's what reconciliation, amen, that's what reconciliation looks like in the local church. It looks like a willingness to be exposed for who we really are in our sinfulness because that's what the gospel is teaching us. One of the biggest lies that the devil puts in all of our minds is that we need to justify ourselves. 
That, that is the biggest lie. If you feel like you have a need to justify yourself in any way, shape, or form, then you don't fully understand the justification that Jesus pours out for you at the cross. None of us can stand before God on our own justified. God justifies us. God is the one who declares us righteous. God is the one who anoints us with forgiveness. God is the one who produces reconciliation in our lives. God is the one who gives us peace. All through what Christ has done for us, the boast is not in how good of a person we are. Our boast is not in how well we do ministry on our own. Our boast should be in what Christ has done for us. Christ is our ministry. It's what Christ can do in the lives of others. Not what I can do for him, not what you can do for him. That's the power of Christ to remove sin in the local church. And that's what the Corinthians had to do. If you think about that young man in the Corinthian church, he was sleeping with his stepmother, and then he was boasting about it in the church. And then other people in the church started boasting about it. And then other people in the church started being tempted with the kind of sexual immorality that he had committed. And what the Apostle Paul calls them to do is he calls them to remove him from the church. That's what God wants to do with our sin. He wants to eradicate it. It's incredibly vital to have a healthy fellowship in a local church where every believer in that local church is humble enough to live circumspectly. Have you thought about what that means? This is what I mean by circumspectly. You're able to be wrong. You don't always have to be right about every single thing. None of us are right about every single thing. And even if we were, that doesn't matter. What matters is that God is right. <laughs> what matters is that God is honored. What matters is that we're all submitting to God. There's a huge difference between, I'm willing to be taught about this, but here's what I think. We can be in meetings where we say that. I'm willing to be taught about this, but here's what I think about it. Versus... This is what I think about it, and that's the bottom line, and you will think about it that way too. Can you hear the difference between those two? They both have an opinion. They both think they're right about something. But one has the humility of Christ. The other one has the pride of the world. We're called to have that kind of humility in our interactions because it helps us live circumspectly, humbly. You know what Jesus said to his disciples? This is what happened. Jesus was with his disciples. And the disciples were saying, Jesus, who can sit on your right hand and who can sit on your left hand in the kingdom? And Jesus said, where are the children? And he brought the children. And he said, look at these children who are like playing and throwing toys and, you know, hitting each other and eating candy. And some of them don't know their left and their right. He actually embraced them. He embraced them. And he said, unless you become like this little child, you'll never enter the kingdom. Amen. That is faith. That is humility. That's circumspection. That's willing to be wrong. Knowing that what matters is God and his truth, his righteousness. If you live like that, you'll be able to pinpoint sin a lot more quickly in your life. To repent of it and change and move on in grace, motivated by God's love, not motivated in the burden of judgment. That's the beauty of the gospel. God's removed all the judgment against us. We're free to repent regularly. Repentance should be just a regular habit in the Christian life because of what Christ has done for us. We want to do that so that we don't infect others with the sin that's infected us. So Laban deceives Jacob. The deception is a sin. It's causing problems. It's blasting its way through all the relationships. And Jacob, what he ends up doing is he finds himself doing the exact same thing. He starts playing favorites, like in verse 30, doesn't he? So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah and served Laban for another seven years. So, so now you've got Jacob being infected by this sort of hostile, unloving attitude that's washed on him, right, from Laban's family. And so he starts playing favorites between Rachel and Leah. At this point, there's a break. So that's Laban's deception. And that's what deception does whenever sin is deceiving us in the church. But what about God? What's God doing here? How is God's love being present and manifesting itself in these relationships? Look at verse 31. When the Lord saw 
So he's watching all of this. He saw that Leah was hated. He opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. So God is not only concerned about what's going on, but now God is going to fix it. And he does it by turning the tables on what's happening here. Do you remember when Jacob deceived Esau? Now Laban deceives Jacob. He gets a taste of his own medicine. And when Jacob chooses to love Rachel, God turns the tables on that. And God chooses to love Leah, just like he did for Hagar, and gives her a son. And those sons that he's about to give her are the beginnings of the 12 tribes of Israel. It's so powerful what God is doing. This is what God has always done. God is not only always faithful to his promises, 100% of the time, without question, he's faithful to you. In all of his promises, God is going to be faithful. But he's also faithful to his promises in the lives of those who are struggling, in the lives of those who are hated, in the lives of those who are depressed. Maybe you're struggling this morning. Now, I was thinking about God's love manifested to me here, and it's amazing to see God consistently throughout the Bible, close and near to those who are unloved. If you're struggling this morning because you're unloved, maybe you are. Or you're struggling this morning because you're depressed, because you feel so alone. Or you're struggling this morning because someone has masqueraded the seat right in front of you. And it hurt you. It had a deep effect on you, and you don't know how to deal with it. Know this. God is near you. God loves you. God is near the brokenhearted. He's not with those who are proud. God rejects people who are proud. He's near to those who are humble, those who know they need help. Ask God. God is faithful. He'll never let you down. If you're the deceivers, God never deceives you. And he will sustain you. He doesn't wear a mask. Like people around us like to wear masks. God is honest and exposes who he really is. That's what he's doing right here. There's not one person here this morning who has not been hurt by another person. We've all been hurt. Some of us more than others. We've all been lied to. We've all been guilty of playing favorites. And all of us have had our hearts broken. You know why? Because all of us probably have experienced what it feels like to love someone or love someone deeply who let us down. They were holding all the cards and then they just dropped them. We didn't know what to do. It's like Leah. Her heart's broken. She feels alone. Where can she turn? She turns to God. She remembers that God is near her. God is near you this morning. He's near you. If you're feeling desperate, or you feel like no one can understand your problems, or you feel like you tried to talk to someone about it, maybe it was a grandparent or a parent, you were trying to talk to them about an issue, and you just got rejected. But they thought they were accepting you. How complicated can that be? That's the complication of family dynamics, isn't it? And you don't know where to turn. You don't know who to talk to. Turn to God. Turn to God. He will listen to you. He will help you. Psalm 34, 18, listen to this. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Don't you feel like your spirit's crushed sometimes? God saves you. Psalm 147, 3. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Do you know why God does that? Because God's heart has been broken. Remember when Adam and Eve ate the fruit? God's heart broke when they did that. Remember when Cain killed Abel? God's heart broke. When Israel bows down to a golden calf, God's heart breaks. When David seduces Bathsheba, when Israel is exiled to Babylon, when his one and only son is crucified. God can sympathize with the broken heart. He understands what it feels like to have your heart break. If you're looking for sympathy this morning, you're looking for compassion, look no further than the Lord God. He is near to you. Jesus, if you read through the Gospels, pay attention to who Jesus hangs out with. Jesus spends more time with prostitutes 
with people who are so demon-possessed that they're throwing themselves on boulders and rocks to scrape their skin bloody. He spends more time with those who are blind and lame than hardly anyone else. This is who Jesus hangs out with. Can you imagine living in Jerusalem and being blind when Jesus walked the earth? There were two blind men who were outside of Jericho, and every day they saw hundreds, if not thousands of people, probably most of them avid synagogue goers, just walk by them and not help them one bit. When Jesus walks out of Jericho and the crowd is around him, he hears these two blind men crying out for mercy. Someone be merciful to me. And Jesus, in the midst of all those people that he could hang out with and go and eat with and who want to be around him, walks through all that crowd to those two blind men and puts his hands on their eyes, heals them. That is how near God is to the broken heart. Don't say he's not near. He is near to the desperate. He is close to them. This happens over and over and over again throughout the Gospels. Jesus is close to those whose spirit has been crushed. Those who are most rejected by society. The same is true today. Our society rejects all kinds of people. Jesus is near to them. He's sympathetic. He's compassionate. And he declares God's truth to them. Just think of that. Jesus is the one who knows all things. He actually calls himself truth. He, he embodies truth. Think about all the things we don't know. I don't even know how many panels of colors are on the stained glass in this room. I don't know how many hair, hairs are on my head. I don't know if I'm going to have another bicycle accident. I'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> we don't know how many days we'll live on this earth. Jesus knows every single one of those things perfectly. He knows all of our motivations perfectly. And yet he still shows us compassion. He still is near to you. At your worst moment, when you really hated someone, or you really wanted to get revenge, or you were tempted to lie, or you wanted to have your own way, Jesus still loved you. He still loved you. He still held you close. He still died for you. So I was riding Everett's bicycle. And I was going very fast. And the bike stopped moving. But I kept moving. And this is what happened, Brie. See that? I told, I told Brielle that, you know what happened? I said that I was running so fast that the air was causing friction with my skin. And I started bleeding. She said, no, you didn't. You fell off the bike. I fell off that bike and I scraped up my skin. And you know when I did that, it burned. You ever done that? You ever had a hamburger like that? Just turned your skin into meat. I was bleeding. Chloe was crying. I walked in. People asked me a million questions. I didn't answer any of them. Just walked straight to the bathroom. Bleeding all over the place. But boy, it burned, you know? I mean, it burned. It's hard to sleep that night. I had it on my hands, too. You feel me? <laughs> you know who feels me more? Jesus. Jesus had the skin ripped off his back. You know that cord, that whip that they use? It's lots of cords. It had pieces of bone in it that were woven into it. It had glass that was woven into it. Woven into it. it had nails and metal. They would weave this thing. And they would throw this thing on your back, and it would stick in, and then they'd rip it out. they just rip the skin off the back. It burned! How it must have burned like hellfire. You ever think about this? That was the one who invented music. They were doing that to him. That was the one, the Bible says, holds all things together for his own glory. So all the molecules that hold an ice cream sundae together to make it taste good, Jesus thought of that. He thought of that. That's the one whose flesh they were turning into hamburger meat. 
And he did that for you. Surely we can be content, can we? Surely we can learn to not complain. I mean, there's a huge difference between critiquing and complaining. Critiquing is great. Constructive criticism, being able to help make things better in the church, outside the church, in each other's lives. It's completely different than complaining. With a self-righteous attitude, a self-serving spirit, Jesus emptied himself and experienced the burn of hell for us so that we could be included in the kingdom. If you think about the kingdoms of this world, they come and go, don't they? The world can have its kingdoms. All of them. The one we're in right now. Because those kingdoms pass away like sand dunes of the sea. But Christ's kingdom that he purchased with his blood never ends. It's an eternal kingdom. And we all get to participate. If we're humble enough to admit that we need Jesus. And we're humble enough to admit that we need to help others need Jesus too. To help them see that Christ is the cure. And in that, we find contentment. It's in that spiritual understanding of what Christ has done for us. We learn how to become like him by giving our lives away. And we do that in relationships with one another. If you're a Christian in a local church and you don't give your life away to another Christian, and you don't show them the, the sacrificial love that Christ has shown you, ever, I would question if you actually know Jesus. Because if there's any way that people see we have been changed by Jesus, it's that kind of love that's willing to experience the burn even for one another, to sacrifice for one another, just like Christ did for us. If there's any way you can cultivate contentment, because you, you should think about it. How do you cultivate contentment in your life? Cultivate it by praising Jesus for what he's done. That's how contentment's cultivated. It's like soil. If you want a, a good example of a garden, don't come to my house. Because my garden doesn't look that great. All right? It's got some weeds. needs some cultivation. needs some additional soil. needs some amenities. You need to go to the Osprey's house. All right? Because that thing is well maintained. You need to go to the James's house. Yes. Yeah, James, that's better. Push it in there. Because that, that soil's been cultivated. It's got all it needs to produce a healthy, healthy growth. The contentment in our hearts needs that cultivation. It needs some amenities. Praise is one of those. And that's exactly what we see happening here in Leah's life. Look at verse 35. She's praising the Lord. It says this, and she conceived again and bore a son. And said, this time I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah. One of the greatest hymn writers of all time was William Kuyper. Maybe you've heard that name before. He's written many hymns that we sing. William Kuyper, he was admitted to a psychiatric hospital three times, at least, for depression. Twice he tried unsuccessfully to commit suicide. If there's ever a Christian who really struggled with interpersonal demons, William Kuyper did, which is why his hymns are that much more powerful, because they're coming from a sincere heart of someone who is trying to praise the Lord, even in the midst of really difficult circumstances. And he juxtaposes God's goodness with tragedy all the time in his hymns. Hear what he says. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take, the clouds ye so much dread. Those clouds that we dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessing upon your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sins, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. But God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. The reason why sorrow and joy 
are juxtaposed like that is because that is how the Christian life is described in the Bible. The Apostle Paul's poetry. poetry. Yet always rejoicing. Psalm 126, those who sow in tears. Because we do sometimes, don't we? We're on mission and on ministry and working together to accomplish great things for the gospel. We're crying. We're sorrowful. We're sowing it in tears. Shall weep with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping bear the seed of sowing and will come home shouting with joy because of the sheaves they bring in. What frustrates you in the Christian life? Are you frustrated? Do you have frustrations? Abraham is frustrated. If you think about Abraham's life and the rest of the patriarchs, he wasn't given a map of every single detail, everything laid out for him, of everything God wanted him to do, exactly the way God had wanted him to do it. God just said, go! Just go! Be a sojourner! Go! It's frustrating. He lived a whole life of frustration. And God was near with his grace with every step of him. Because that's what it takes to walk the Christian life. It takes a faith, a trust that God must provide because he has to provide anyway. Are you trusting in that, even in the midst of frustrations? Jacob's no different. He had a million frustrations. But now he's called to learn a lesson, isn't he? And that lesson is to trust in the Lord's providence, not in his own way, not in his own understanding of things. If we're trusting in the Lord, the Lord will make our path straight. He'll help us work through the frustrations. He'll not grab us and give us a detour, you know? There's been all these detours because the bridge has been closed, you know? we got to go in a different direction. That's not what God does whenever we face a frustration. He's like, we're not taking a detour. We're going through it. But we're going to go through it trusting, aren't we? In God's providence and what God can do in the midst of the trial. All of us are frustrated by so many things. Are you clinging to Christ? Or are you clinging to the frustration being mitigated? Think about the mistakes we make. Every single person in here makes mistakes. What do you do when you make a mistake? You make a mistake in parenting? You make a mistake in grandparenting? You make a mistake in your workplace? Maybe you make a mistake in ministry. You make a mistake in your home? You make a mistake with friends? Don't let the mistake define you. Let the providence of God's grace towards you in the gospel define who you are, what you will believe, how you will act, decisions you make in the midst of the frustration so that through it, God gives you a blessing. Maybe God's trying to teach you something. Maybe you need to learn contentment. Maybe you need to learn how to praise the Lord more through the trial. Whatever it is God is teaching you, the profound and enjoyable and attractive praise of God that he offers you in the gospel will see you through. It's like a ballast in a boat. I think a lot of times the reason why some of us get shipwrecked in our faith and in our attitudes and in our relationships in the church is because our ballast isn't big enough in our boat. You know what a ballast is? I kind of do. I'm not a shipman. But it's a huge beam that runs in the bottom of the boat. If that beam is really weak and small, then whenever the wave is coming, your boat's going to flip over. And you'll be thrown out into the ocean thinking, I don't know what to do. So you need a bigger ballast. The way you get a bigger ballast is through the praise that comes from your understanding of the gospel and God's goodness towards you. So your ballast gets really, really, really thick. The thicker it gets, the heavier it is, it sits. Whenever those waves come, you just keep sailing. Your ballast might be so big that you can pull other boats onto your boat and help them get a bigger ballast to set them a sail and to help others. That's the power of the gospel in us. Don't let deception define you. Let God's love and faithfulness be your ballast so that you can sail through troubled waters, praising Him all of your days and helping others do the same. This is why we sing about Jesus' blood. This is why we remind each other of Jesus' blood. This is why we offer forgiveness to one another and shower one another with grace, even in the midst of frustration, even in the midst of trial. Because through those relationships, God's Spirit is healing what is broken in each other's lives. Let's pray and ask God to do that more and more as we continue praising Him. Let's pray together. Help us to praise you, Lord Jesus. 
for who you really are. As the one who has conquered sin and death on our behalf, as the one who humbled himself to the point of death, so that we can be healed of all of our brokenness and be encouraged to live lives that are content to praise you, even though we praise you sometimes with tears, with sorrows, with frustrations, even though sometimes we don't know what the next step is you have for us. Lord, we pray as we continue singing the gospel, drawing near to you because of your gospel, it would be on the forefront of our minds as we help one another live out a holiness that you have started in us for your kingdom's purposes so that people see the kingdom when they see us. We ask this